so, so welcome everyone. And it's my pleasure to introduce our invited speaker for, for today, Max Welling. He is a research chair at University of Amsterdam and, and the VP of Technologies at Qualcomm and also at, at CIFAR. And he did his PhD at, uh, with, with the novel laureate G.T. Hooft in theoretical physics and did postdocs at several places, Caltech, UCL, and, and University of Toronto. And he served our community for, with many different positions as, as board of, of the NIPS Foundation. He's general chair or program chair of, of NIPS, AI, AI Stats, ECCV and also uh, an upcoming conference, MIDL, and, and served also in many editorial boards in machine learning journals. So he has made several contributions in machine learning, in Bayesian inference and deep learning, and has won several awards, including the ECCV, Condrick, Award and also the NSF Career Award. So I'm happy to, to welcome Max and let's give him an applause. All right. Thank you, Jennifer, for those kind words. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. And also thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about intelligence and uh, energy consumption and ways to reduce it. Um, so first, the introduction. So an alternative title for my talk could have been an equation, um, F equals E minus H. And without telling you what F and E and H stand for, I invite you to uh, look at these Dutch celebrities. This is Daphne Schippers, who is the world champion on the 200 meters uh, sprint. And this is Ben Feringa, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016. And from those, you should be able to figure out what E and H are. So it's free energy is energy minus entropy. And this will be the continuing theme uh, throughout my talk today. And there is a very interesting analogy with history which is that um, you know, the energy, which is our ability to perform physical work, um, basically is uh, reflected in the Industrial Revolution in the 1820s, where we started to uh, sort of change, interchange human labor with mechanized labor. And in the 1940s, you know, we started to use data um, and information to make our society more efficient. And, of course, that reflects the entropy, which is the level of organization or information in a system. And already, uh, so long time ago, the physicists realized that um, the physical world can be described by, in terms of information content. And John Archibald Wheeler said famously, it from bit, to reflect this. And this is a quote. It says, it from bit symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has, a, uh, has at bottom an immaterial source and explanation that all things physical are information theoretic in origin. So basically, he said that information is at the very core of everything and that all of physics can be explained by looking at its information content. Now, more recently, um, this statement has, you know, gotten shape in terms of a number of theories. Um, and as I have been trained in physics, I think I can say a few things about it, but not too much because I also forgot a lot. And um, so the first thing that is very interesting is that uh, people like Stephen Hawking realized that black holes are really, really thermodynamic objects where the information content um, is sort of uh, the, the entropy is proportional to the uh, 
area of the event horizon. So you can think of a black hole basically as uh, you know, bits and bytes which are projected onto the horizon of the black hole. Um, and this idea got extended into what's now known as the holographic principle, which was posed by Gerard at Hoofd, uh, which is also my supervisor and Nobel laureate, that basically says that poses that all the information you need to describe everything in the, in the universe can be sort of encoded on the horizon, on the uh, sort of sur surface of the universe. The black hole being a part of that surface, but there's also an outer surface. Um, and you can basically encode all the information you need about physics on that surface. So that's like a hologram, if you want. And more recently, uh, sort of uh, my colleague at the University of Amsterdam took this idea one step further and said that uh, gravity really is an entropic force. Now, what is an entropic force? Um, if you think of a, of a molecule, a long molecule, and you stretch it, and it's at a certain temperature, you'll find that by basically thermal fluctuation, it will want to curl up. And the only reason that it wants to curl up is that there's many more states, curled states, than there is extended states. And, that is, and, and by that mechanism, it's, it's exerting a force on the molecule if you keep it stretched. So that same idea, according to Eric Verlinde, explains gravity, which is basically saying there is information content and that's moving around, it's trying to get to a higher entropy state, and by moving around, it's exerting a force on bodies that uh, explains all of gravity. So um, the most important thing is that physicists have made a lot of progress in tying together energy, physics, and entropy information. And maybe this relation is most beautifully exposed in this uh, story, which is Maxwell's demon, um, that is tr trying to find an argument to see if you can beat the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics basically says that the entropy of any closed system should always increase. And uh, so that the change in, so that the amount of work you can perform is proportional to the change in the free energy, which is equal to minus the change in the energy minus the change in the entropy. And since the entropy always increases, the entropy really represents sort of the, the part of the free energy that cannot be converted into work. So it's like part of your energy you cannot actually convert, convert into physical wor work. And so this entropy is sort of like a barrier to that. And um, Maxwell's demon is the following sort of observation. If you have two chambers, uh, one is a cold chamber and one is a hot chamber, um, and there's a little creature here which observes the molecules that are flying around in these two chambers. It's uh, letting the cold molecules through in this direction and the hot molecules going back into this direction. And by doing that, it could sort of heat up this chamber and cool down this chamber, which is exactly in the opposite direction of what the second law of thermodynamics says, because that means that the entropy will actually decrease. And because this is getting hotter, you can sort of uh, cook uh, some, some egg and uh, you will do physical work. So that seems to run against the second law of thermodynamics. And maybe it's even more beautifully exposed in this thought experiment by Zellar, um, which is a one molecule version of that argument which says that if you have a chamber and there's a single molecule in that, um, then you can extract work from this if you know where the molecule is, because you're going to put some kind of divider in this chamber, and then um, if you know if it's on the right-hand side, you construct a pulley here with a little bit of a weight, and then it will hit this boundary to the left, and it will shift the boundary, and then you can actually do a little bit of work. So the, the important thing is that by knowing where the molecule is, which is one bit of information to the left or to the right, you can extract sort of a minimal amount of work from this uh, system. So, um, okay, so this seems like we can break the second law of thermodynamics, but in fact, the, I think the resolution to this problem um, comes from Jaynes, which is uh, somebody we all know from maximum entropy models, who basically said something really fundamental. He said that the free energy that physicists write down is not really only a property of the physical system, 
It is a subjective quantity. It reflects our ignorance about what we are modeling. And in particular, the entropy that is in the free energy reflects the degree of ignorance that we have about the microscopic state or the microscopic degrees of freedom of that system, right? So that's a bit of a revolutionary statement at the time. It's basically saying, you know, physics is subjective, at least this free energy is subjective. And so following that, it actually seems like if we remove that uncertainty about the system, we could actually uh, turn uh, that information into real work. Now, it's not that easy. In fact, the full resolution is that to do these measurements, you know, you have to typically do work. Um, and it's even more subtle than that. You can actually do these measurements without doing work in some limit, but you have to write down that information in memory. And by the time you're deleting that memory, you're going to actually pay for the energy. And, you know, you increase the entropy again. Um, and so the cycle is then complete, right, because by the time you're going to reuse that memory, um, you're going to pay back the sort of the entropy that you gained by learning about the system. So that saves at least the second law of thermodynamics. But what we learned in the meantime is that we should really think about modeling as a subjective exercise. And, it, and, and the entropy is our ignorance about the system. It's our ignorance about the system, not a property of the physical system per se. And of course, we all know this story. As many of you hopefully bought into the idea maybe that, you know, the modeling is a intrinsically subjective exercise. And of course, this was already sort of used by, by Bayes or the principle of Bayesian statistics. And just to, uh, to repeat a little bit what you probably already know, in Bayesian statistics, the central object of interest is the probability of the data. So capital X is the full sort of data matrix. And you write that as an integral over a prior, which is your, your prior, your subjective prior, over what you think the parameters of the model could look like. Um, and then there's a likelihood term, which is the data given that model parameter. And then you have to integrate over all possible parameter values that you think are reasonable. Um, and then if you make predictions, uh, you shouldn't make a prediction based on a single model. What you should do is first compute your posterior distribution, which is the, your uncertainty over the model parameters, given that you have made some observations, and you compute that posterior by this famous Bayes rule. Um, and then you average over those. You weight all of the parameters by that posterior distribution in order to make your predictions. Right? But the most important thing is that that is actually a subjective way to model the world. And then um, going one step further, um, Rizanen uh, had sort of uh, this paper modeling by shortest data description. He explained how you can think of um, finding the optimal complexity of a model by looking at description length. So he basically posed that the object one should look at is the number of bits you need to use in order to encode your hypothesis. Think of maybe the model, you know, the parameters of your model, um, plus a term which is the number of bits you need in order to encode your data given your hypothesis. And these two terms need to balance. And so if you translate that into sort of maybe more familiar sort of probability distributions, Bayesian sort of uh, language, the first term is the probability of x given the parameters, the log of that, but then the expectation over the posterior distribution. And the second term is the KL between the posterior distribution and the prior. So this term is the complexity of your model, number of bits you require to encode your hypothesis. And this is order one. So in other words, it doesn't depend, it doesn't scale with the number of data points that you have. And this term here, uh, since this is basically a product over the data points, it scales with uh, n. Uh, so this is a sum over n terms. Uh, it's the bits you require to encode your hypothesis. And since this scales with n and this scales with 1, it means that if you have a really small data set, you cannot use a lot of bits to encode your model. But if your data set starts to grow, then you can entertain larger and larger models, um, because basically this term is starting to grow as well. 
And if you want to read more about this, there's this beautiful book by Peter Grunewald that explains all about these ideas. And then, um, so the last of my list of heroes, um, Jeff Hinton, um, who draw, drew from these ideas and um, in his famous paper, uh, keeping neural networks simple by minimum, minimizing the description links of, of the weights, and later also by this paper with Radford Neal, where he just uh, wrote down the math of variational inference. You know, um, he wrote down sort of the variational formulation of uh, of the free energy. So you you write you start with writing down the log probability of the data, and um, you introduce this sort of auxiliary distribution Q, which at this point can be anything. It has to be normalized, but it can be anything. And um, so you take the average of the likelihood term over that posterior minus you know, this KL term, which again is the distance between this sort of approximate posterior and your prior, and then another term, which is to close the gap between the difference between the true posterior and your variational posterior. So this is not hard to derive, um, and it's an equality. Um, turns out that this last term is very hard to get access to because you can't really typically compute this posterior distribution in closed form. So you leave it out, and then it's a bound. And then, uh, so you can write it like this. So, um, you, know, the, you know, the data term minus this sort of complexity term. And if you uh, move one part, you know, the prior term to this in, into here, then it really looks like an energy and an entropy term. So this is the entropy of the distribution Q. Um, and this is then sort of the, the interpreted as the energy. So we can, we can really say that this is also a free energy. Uh, now it's a free energy of a model. It's not the free energy of the physical world, but it's a free energy of a model. Um, and so this is the energy term, and that's the entropy term. So then, so what, what have we just done? Um, so we started with the Helmholtz free energy, which is an en a free energy of a physical system. Then Jane said, well, you know, the entropy is really your ignorance, so it's not just only physics, it's actually also subjective, it's also your, you know, your ignorance that's in that equation. So then we go to Rizanen, who writes down sort of a minimum description length, which is a quantity about the model. Um, then Hinton, who writes down variational Bayes, again, a free energy, explicit expression for a free energy uh, for the model. So this is the modeling side, and here's the physics side. Right, and now I'm going to propose in this talk, you know, to close the circle and say, can we use the entropy that is um, in our sort of model free energy, can we use it to run uh, sort of our machine learning models more efficiently? This means using less actual physical power um, on a real device. So here we're closing that gap back to, to physics. Um, and uh, you know you could argue that the brain has been sort of exploiting this idea. It's a very noisy sort of machine that uh, that has you know leveraged perhaps the fact that you can use this noise and this uncertainty to do very uh, energy efficient computation. So this is a bit speculative, but um, I hope you bear with me. So there is what we will talk about today. So then the next part of the talk, I'll say a few words about large-scale um, approximate Bayesian learning um, and a bit about uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and variational Bayes. Okay, so this is uh, my sort of uh, pendulum. I've been swinging between, so this is not about US politics. I know where I stand in US politics, but I've been swinging between Markov chain Monte Carlo as the best way to do um, sort of approximate Bayesian inference and variational Bayes. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about both of these. So um, the variational Bayesian uh, sort of approximation works as follows. You're after this posterior distribution, P of theta given x, and um, um, you're, uh, there is a sort of you're restricting yourself to a particular family Q, um, and you're trying to find the optimal distribution Q inside that family that is as close as possible to this true posterior distribution. And so by doing that, we are minimizing the KL divergence between our approximating distribution Q 
and the true posterior uh, P. And in MCMC, it's a very different algorithm where we're trying to compute expectations over functions over this posterior distribution by computing an average over a bunch of points, samples from the distribution P theta given X, uh, where we draw the samples from this posterior distribution. And so this looks like this. You know, we have a distribution and we're drawing samples. Now, both of these methods have advantages and disadvantages. So this one is deterministic. Um, so you can sort of use your favorite optimization algorithm to, to find this optimal Q. Um, but it's also biased, because even if you have an infinite amount of data, you will not close this gap, because you've restricted yourself to a, to a family that cannot actually model P. So that even in the infinite data limit, you'll still make mistakes. Um, now, there's a lot of local minima in this optimization procedure. Um, so, you know, that's, that's problematic in some sense. Uh, but it's easy to at least assess whether you have converged to a local optimum. On the other hand, this one, it's stochastic. And the error typically is not coming from a bias, but it's coming from a sampling error, right? Because there's randomness involved. And if you would redo the procedure, you would actually get a different set of samples and therefore a different answer. Um, so there's sampling error in here. And uh, so that, that's the source of error here. It's unbiased if you wait long enough you know, then at least you'll get an unbiased estimate of the object you're interested in. Now, it's very hard to so this local minima issue translates into mixing between the different modes of the distribution. It's very hard to make sure that if you ex explored one mode and the other mode is somewhere else, you have to go through a valley um, that you reach that mode. Um, and it's even, it's, in this case, it's actually very hard to assess uh, convergence. Um, you have to run multiple Markov chains and see if they start to sort of come up with the same answers. But that's typically very hard. So Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, works as follows. You know, you, take, uh, you start with an initial distribution of your choice. And, um, and you move that distribution using a transition kernel um, to the distribution that you're interested in. And you can design this transition kernel in such a way that you're guaranteed that at convergence, you're, you have converged to the correct distribution. Now, you're not actually moving the entire distribution. What you're doing is you, you represent the distribution with a single sample every time. So you draw from the first distribution, you draw a single sample. And then you know, instead of moving the entire distribution, you make sure that the next sample you draw is from the distribution that you would have gotten if you would have applied this transition kernel all the way up to the end. And at some point, this thing converges. And then you're drawing multiple samples from the converged distribution. And you use that to compute your averages. So then um, this is one, there's one big problem with MCMC method in an era when the data sets are really large, which is um, that it fails what I call the big data test. So what is the big data test? So you imagine you have an infinitely large data set. Um, will your procedure give a reasonable answer, right? Now, any reasonable procedure should give you an answer in finite amount of time um, if you have an infinite amount of data set. After all, you could just you know, take a subset of that infinite data set and just run any other procedure in finite time, and you would get an answer. So any procedure that doesn't give you an answer you know, with an infinite data set will fail this kind of big data test. And it turns out MCMC, as it is usually written down, uh, fails that test. Because at every you know, time you draw a sample, you have to look at all the data. And if that's an infinite data set, you'll take you infinitely long. So um, in 2013, uh, UI and I, UI Tay and I, started to think about maybe can we you know, update um, MCMC in such a way that it will actually give you reasonable answers after a finite amount of time if you have a very large data set. And we were inspired by gradient dis, uh, ascent, which is basically you take your, you know, your prior plus your likelihood term, which is proportional to your, um, to your posterior, um, and you compute a gradient with respect to your parameters, right? so that decomposes into these two terms. Now, this is the offending term, because it depends on all the data set. Right? And you take a gradient step. So people have known how to deal with the big data problem for learning, for gradient descent learning, they just do stochastic mini-batching. So they, instead of for every update, you look at all the data, you look at a random subset of the data, and then you scale this thing up by a factor n over n, so that uh, so you get uh, sort of updates uh, the infinite amount of time. 
And of course, there's a bunch of uh, requirements on that epsilon, the step size, the step size has to decrease over time um, and, and satisfy these uh, sort of constraints. So that's just to cast a gradient descent that we all know and love for deep learning, works very well. Um, but then there's this other algorithm called Lange Venn Dynamics, which is really just like gradient de ascent. Um, but then if you miraculously add like this noise term, it's a normal distribution with zero mean and epsilon. Now note, note epsilon is actually the step size, or two times the step size. So if you add this amount of noise to every step, then in the limit of very small epsilon, you will sample from the posterior distribution. So in, in, instead of actually converging to a point, you'll be sampling from the correct posterior distribution. It sounds like a miracle, but it works. And then um, since we cannot actually do very small Epsilon, um, what we do is uh, we add a Metropolis-Hastings except reject step to make sure that we actually sample from the correct distribution. Okay, so that's called Lange Venn Dynamics. And then we thought, well, there is a very close parallel between these two, so let's see if we can also make a close parallel between these two. So now instead of looking at all the samples, we draw a small subset of the samples here, um, and uh, so we scale by the factor n over n, um, and we have uh, also a step size which is decreasing over time with the same requirements. And since this is a very expensive step as well, it looks at all the data point, we just remove it uh, and observe that if epsilon goes to zero, in fact, you know, the procedure will sample from the correct distribution. And so this then is stochastic gradient line event dynamics. It's the first of a, a long list of algorithms which improved this particular algorithm, which runs MCMC in the, in when you have a very large uh, data set and gives you approximations. And so what have we really done? Um, so as I said, uh, in variational Bayes and uh, MCMC, you know, one has sort of a bias. The error is represented by a bias, and the other one has an error that's represented by the variance. So we play the same game here. So you know, on the one end, um, if you have a distribution with a large step size, then uh, you're sampling from the wrong distribution, but you're making a lot of progress. And because you're making a lot of progress, uh, you can draw a lot of samples. And so the situation is you're drawing from the wrong distribution, but you can draw many samples. So this means that you can reduce the variance in your estimate, but you increase the bias in your estimate. And in the other limit, when you know epsilon is very small, you will only draw very few samples um, or independent samples if you want, but you're drawing it from a distribution that's closer to the true distribution. So all this is doing is basically uh, sort of playing this game of bias variance um, you know, error, just putting the error either in the bias or the variance, and it turns out you know, it's, it's actually beneficial to trade off a little bit of the variance with some of the bias. And so in variational Bayesian learning, um, so the situation is a little bit different. Um, so again, you know, this, we're in a family and we're trying to find a distribution which is closest to the true posterior distribution. So that's, now let's look at that, uh, that uh, free energy equation that we have. So again, that's a, an integral over the approximate posterior times, you know, the log of the likelihood in the prior and then, you know, this entropy term. And then, um, you know, in order to maximize this, the best way to do that is to actually do a reparameterization. So this is something that, you know, uh, Dirk Kingman and I introduced in 2013. Um, so instead of trying to do this complicated integral, which, which might still be complicated even though Q might be a simple distribution, what you do is you transform uh, theta to another variable omega, random variable omega, and this function going from omega and phi, uh, you know, uh, maps you know, these two to theta in such a way that, you know, this measure Q theta day theta equals to P zero omega d omega. And then the important part is that this distribution should be a standard distribution, a distribution that does not depend on any parameters. You know, it could be like a standard normal distribution, doesn't depend on any parameters. The parameters are now in this function. So if you then apply that transformation, then this Q turns, you know, d theta Q theta turns into d omega P zero omega, and then every, th every time you, you see a theta here, you have to replace it by, you know, this function F omega th uh, phi everywhere. 
right? But now, and then you have to, and now you can turn the gradient, you can pull it through this expectation, and you can apply it here and here and there and there. Okay, so that's called the reparameterization trick. And in fact, this is a really important trick because it reduces the variance. If you would start uh, sampling from this distribution directly and use, use an algorithm called reinforce, you'll have very high variance, and this trick will reduce the variance a lot. So that's the you know, way that we can train these variational Bayesian methods efficiently. Okay, so this is the uh, introductory part. Um, now I'll tell you a little bit about uh, efficient uh, deep learning. And so um, I just want to share with you this plot which I made, and you should take with a, a lot of grains of salt, um, because I just looked up some models in the literature. Um, and I just you know, hypothesized that you know, the first models in 1943, which were the first sort of perceptrons, you know, they could have ordered 10 parameters, because there was not really a computer to learn them. So you may have to have set them by hand. So let's say that in 43, you know, there were about 10 parameters in our models. And then in 88, which is the sort of previous uh, neural network hype, there was a model called NetTalk, which had about 20,000 parameters, which seems a lot at that time. And then in 2009, when you know, Hinton started you know, his deep belief net papers, um, there were about 10 million parameters in these models, which at the time looked like incredible. Um, and then uh, I visited Google and Yahoo actually in 2013, and people were talking about models with 1 billion parameters. And nowadays, when you talk to people from Google, they apologize if they say that their model is one, only 1 billion parameters. And then, um, oh god, what is that? <laughs> All right. Um, and then in 2017, there was a paper called Extremely Large Neural Networks, which had 137 billion parameters. Right? And then if you plot these numbers, like on a log linear plot, which basically means that a straight line is exponential growth, you'll find that you know, if we keep on going, then in 2025, we're going to reach 100 trillion parameters, which is about the size of the brain, if you want. That's the amount, that's the amount of synapses we have in the brain. Right? And that's not very far away. I mean, we all hope to live you know, to that time, which is interesting. right? Um, it also points to the fact that you know, these models, as they grow, they're using more and more energy to run. And, um, and the question is, do we, you know, is this a sustainable path forward? And I'll argue that there's multiple reasons why this is not really a sustainable path forward. And maybe we can be you know, a bit uh, inspired by the human brain, which seems to do at least 100 times better in terms of energy efficiency. OK, so why? Why do I think that it is important to start dealing with this energy question now? Um, I think there's two really important reasons. The first one is that the value created by AI must, in fact, exceed the cost to run the service, right? So if you rank posts on Facebook or other social media, right, and you're going to spend a little bit of money, maybe in the order of a ten thousandth of a cent, uh, a micro dollar, let's say, on each one of those rankings, then you, the revenue you get by doing that in terms of advertisements should outstrip you know, that money that you invest in running that, you know, that, uh, that neural net. Right? And as you know, we, we, um, uh, we, we start to run these models in, in sort of bigger and bigger environments, at some point, the economic benefit will, uh, will outweigh, you know, the sort of the, the energy cost will outweigh the, the economic benefit. Now, there's another reason why, um, you know, energy efficiency is really important, and that's that I believe that a lot of the AI will move from the cloud to the edge, right? And so um, if you have, like, a smart hearing aid, you don't want that hearing aid to use a lot of energy. First of all, you know, there might not be a big battery in that thing, but also you don't want it to, to warm up a lot you know, behind your ear. Same thing with a cell phone, where it shouldn't sort of get very hot in your pocket. Right? So when we are applying these uh, methods to uh, sort of you know, uh, edge computation, it's really important that um, you know, we uh, make sure that the energy envelope is, is under control.
Um, so the workloads are very compute intensive on phones. There's lots of complex concurrencies. You have to do many tasks at the same time. Often it has to be done in real time, and it's always on. At the same time, of course, you have really a small device. You don't have a lot of storage, and you don't have a lot of battery life. So that causes really a lot of uh, sort of challenges, and sort of energy consumption is a, is a big issue. So therefore, the central sort of um, maybe uh, sort of a you know, statement I want to make here is that you know, maybe we should start thinking about AI algorithms um, and measure their success, uh, not in just solely in terms of their accuracy, but uh, in the amount of sort of intelligence that they provide per kilowatt hour, right? So how much intelligence can we extract from a neural net you know, per, per joule or per kilowatt hour? OK, so now I'm going to try to go into a little bit more detail about some things. Um, so, uh, so here's a, a neural net. And I'm going to you know, sort of explain to you first the local reparameterization trick, which was introduced in this paper here, um, where you know, what you do is you, you convert the uh, stochasticity on your parameters um, to stochasticity on your, on your sort of neurons here. So basically in equations, when you look at the energy term of the free energy, it's an expectation over theta py given sort of, and then theta times the nonlinearity times the previous activations. Um, so we're going to convert that into a distribution over the activations z given the previous activations, um, and then py given z, because that's this term, right? And so in an animation, this looks like this. So you can see these things wiggle here. So this is the parameters which are being fluctuated under the prior or the posterior. And that is converted into so the fluctuations on the activation. So that's sort of an animation of what the local reparameterization trick really does. Um, and now I'm going to try to explain to you how that idea um, can be used to uh, you know, remove or, or how Bayesian statistics can be used to reduce energy in neural networks. Um, OK, so we start with a model that hasn't seen any data whatsoever. And we're going to look at these two parameters, w1 and w2. So they're on these axes here, so w1 value, w2 value. Right? And now we're going to use this sort of wiggling so that we, we wiggle the whole thing. So the whole method is stochastic. Right? We, have a, we have a posterior distribution over our parameters, and the whole thing is stochastic. And as we wiggle this thing, these parameters w and w2, they take on different values. Right? So this, this only happens in a Bayesian perspective of, of uh, deep learning. And then, OK, so this is under the prior, wiggling under the prior. Now we're going to you know, use data. And what's happening is that we're going to change this prior distribution in a posterior distribution over possible values. Right? And what we see here is that you know, the, you know, the, the w1 actually was constrained to a small value. So we really transformed the data into parameter values, right? So we moved the information which was in the data into the value of parameter W1. But W2 actually you know, wasn't constrained at all. It stayed equally uncertain. And so that's sort of like a very useless parameter. And now what I'm going to say is that we can either remove that parameter or we can quantize it so that we can you know, represent it at very low precision. Right? And if we represent it at very low precision, you can potentially run it at much lower energy cost you know, on, a, on hardware. And a, somewhat a similar procedure um, happens when you, you, know, you actually you know, look at the values of the activations. And some of these activations be, be, you know, remain completely uncertain. Um, and quite useless, and some of these neurons can therefore be pruned using the same ideas. OK, so now I'll go into more detail, explaining a little bit about recent work on um, you know, using Bayesian statistics to do compression. So uh, in terms of the, ex you know, the, uh, the equations that I already explained, we need to choose a prior, in this case a prior over the parameters, and we use this auxiliary uh, you know, variable z as well, which we integrate over, um, to define a prior over the weights. And the thing that you really need to sort of take away from this prior without trying to parse this equation too much is that it's a very sparsity-inducing prior. It really likes 
things which are not very useful to go away, and it's a sparsity inducing on the, on, the, on the level of the neurons, not so much on the level of the parameters. So it's trying to get rid of entire neurons if they're not contributing very much to the prediction. We also have to choose a posterior distribution, Q of W comma Z, and, and this is the particular version that we use. It's called a dropout posterior. Um, sort of uh, this paper by uh, Dmitry Vetrov and his students um, developed it, um, and sort of we have also some work that's closely related. Um, and uh, so the posterior is, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the important part of this is that the mean and the variance are proportional. So bigger means also have larger noise. And so if you encode this in this posterior distribution, and then, um, so this is an, a very beautiful um, animation that was made by uh, Dmitry Vetrov's students, where you show, you know, if you run this algorithm, if you do inference and learning in this algorithm, um, how this, me this method sparsifies. It just gets rid of most of the parameters of this model. So here you see the accuracy. The accuracy stays about the same. So you're not actually compromising the model in terms of its accuracy. But the compression ratio goes up to 270 times, which means you just keep one out of uh, 270 weights. The rest all go away. Right? And it completely sparsifies these filter maps. So this is really fascinating, in my opinion, that we over-parameterize these neural networks by such a large degree. And I've learned you know, throughout this con conference, actually, that this might have a lot to do with the fact that you can do a lot better optimization if you're in a much bigger space. But then once you have found your model, you can then prune it down very effectively. And clearly, once you've pruned it down, you know, many of these filter maps can just be thrown out, and that will help you save energy when you do the computation. So here's the same plot, but now for the, for the last fully connected layer, and you see that almost no weight survives, and the, compression and the accuracy just stays the same. So I think this is a very interesting result where we can use Bayesian methods to compress these models by a huge factor. So I want to go a little bit into, in the last uh, sort of 10 minutes, I want to go a little bit into some of the more recent papers that we did. Uh, they're not even published. They're somewhere out in the archive, probably. Um, so this is work um, between OpenAI and MLab, where we uh, basically, again, look at the sort of the energy term, and we write every parameter as, you know, a theta prime times a function g of s, which, uh, you know, which basically you can think of it as either, you know, a soft version of a binary value 0 or 1. So if it's 0, this parameter gets prunes out. If it's 1, it will keep the parameter in. Um, and, but, but the point is we're actually making it a soft uh, version of it. So in, in, in fact, the version uh, is called hard concrete. So uh, the, it, the, the model is like, a, it's a, this is the distribution. So it has a little bit of probability between 0 and 1, but it has a spike at 1, and it has a spike at 0. Um, and then uh, we add an extra term, which basically says the probability for non-zero values of this function should you be restricted. I want, you know, I want most of my mass to be on, z on 0 so that I can prune out as much um, you know, parameters as possible. Okay, so there's some results that, again, you can get, you can keep the same accuracy, but you can reduce these models. So, so, these, so this is the MLP with 784, 300, and 100 neurons. And, you know, you can get down to 290 to 400 or to 66, 88, 33. So there's a huge amount of compression that's happening if you apply this. And this is a fairly practical method, I would say. Um, so this is another work. Uh, this is with... Uh, uh, Borsh Yuva Delta Lab, which is a lab within the University of Amsterdam. Uh, sort of Joran Peters did this work. Um, and so this is a binary neural net. Again, I'm going to exploit the fact um, that we are going to use, um, uh, that we're going to use, a, you know, a stochasticity and, and probabilities in order to uh, run it at higher efficiency. Um, so there's a distribution over, you know, the model parameters here. Um, because of central limit theorem, you're collecting a lot of these sort of binary values. Uh, you get some kind of thing that looks like a Gaussian distribution here. Then we define stochastic batch normalization and stochastic max pooling, which are generalizations of batch normalization and pooling um, for the case of stochastic random variables. Then we threshold again. So we take this distribution and we threshold it at some point. So again, we convert to a binomial distribution. Then we sample from that. And then we have, again, the next layer of 
uh, binary activations. And then it turns out you can do backpropagation throughout this whole chain, and you can train these networks quite efficiently and get uh, fairly good results. So um, here's another piece of work uh, between Qualcomm AI Research and uh, Cuva, where, um, again, we, we think about you know, training a neural net knowing that in the end, the, the parameters will have to be quantized on a grid. So that we are going to train it so that it knows that it's going to be quantized, and it doesn't lose a lot of accuracy when that happens. So here is uh, sort, of the, sort of the values for the parameters, and we choose some grid points. In fact, you can also learn the grid points. We have some distribution over where you know, the parameters can land. And then we, uh, we have a probability. So we basically throw all the probability mass here. We throw it sort of in this bucket, and this becomes this probability. And since this is all done with probabilities, you can actually train and backpropagate through all these probabilities. And you see after training that the model really likes to quantize itself. It likes to sort of put spikes on these sort of grid points. Um, and in fact, the last layer, it tries to binarize itself. So again, uh, you, can, you can sort of train yourself to be quantizable, and the results look pretty good. OK, so the last topic I want to talk about is spiking neural nets. Um, so this is another way in which we are wasting a lot of energy. Um, if you have like a surveillance camera, um, it's looking you know, at a shop. Um, it's really 99% of the time, nothing happens. And so if you would analyze every frame using a deep neural net, you're wasting a huge amount of energy. Right? And so it's basically like this, which is a sort of a spiking camera, which only processes things that change. So that sort of inspired us to come up with a spiking neural net. So the normal neural net has an input, then has a linearity, then has a nonlinearity, et cetera. So we replace that by an input. We do an encoding step. I'll explain a bit what that is later. Then we do a quantization step. Then we do a linearity, and then we do a decoding step. Okay, and so the the input is the encoder is now a stateful sort of um, uh, representation. It's a linear combination of the actual signal that's coming in and the difference with the last signal, right? And this is basically the fact that you look at the difference. If nothing changes, then this term goes to zero. So then the quantization is known as something like sigma delta modulation, and it's similar to uh, something I did a long time ago called herding. I knew it was some good for something, and we found that it is good for sort of quantizing these uh, sort of these uh, input values. Um, it's basically a little potential that rises, and then you sort of when it reaches a certain point, it sends out a spike, and then it sort of resets. And then this is the inverse of that, so it's sort of the, the decoder. And what happens if you only take sort of differences? Um, or the sigma delta modulation is pure form. If you have a signal, it's going to approximate that signal by a piece, piecewise constant function. And every time it sends a spike, it changes that, that level. And if we do this thing, um, we add, we, if we add a little bit of the input, it will have exponential decaying sort of parts of it as well. And so the most important thing is we have to mix this in so we can actually do stable backpropagation on this spiking neural net. And again, um, so this trains very well. Okay, so uh, let me quickly then f uh, sort of stop. Um, so uh, we've discussed, uh, you know, black holes and physics and how it relates. Really, underlying all of that is is information theory. Um, we've seen that uh, gravity might actually be entropy maximization. And from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, actually, we know that the Earth really is a big computer. Um, that is trying to compute the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, and it's built by these mice. Um, and if you think that's funny, let me remind you that there is a bunch of people who actually do think that we live in a giant simulation. Um, and so maybe it isn't all that strange idea of an idea. In fact, if you look at this in some sense, you, know, you, could, you could argue the universe is a huge computer trying to compute something. So we looked at... Uh, basically, the free energy cycle going from physical free energy to model free energy and back. Um, so, uh, you know, I've talked about Bayesian deep learning and how it can help us compress and quantize our neural nets in order to save energy. Of course, we all know that Bayesian uh, methods also help you regularize and generalize better. Um, there's interesting work also here at ICML on using Bayesian deep learning for confidence estimation. 
Um, and finally, you know, there is also interesting work that shows that um, Bayesian methods can help you train more privacy-preserving models, and also it seems to give you a little bit of robustness to adversarial examples, but it doesn't protect you completely. Okay, then, uh, let me end by this quote, which surprised me that Steve Jobs actually knew about free energies. It says, the revolution, the information, oh, this revolution, the information revolution, is a revolution of free energy as well, but of another kind, free intellectual energy. Um, so I would say think deep and think free. And then uh, I have two quick announcements. Uh, you know, we have recently started Qualcomm AI Research, uh, which is an environment where we can do fundamental research and write papers about all of these intriguing problems about compression and quantization. And of course, we are hiring like everybody else. Um, actually, we are also hiring at the University of Amsterdam. We are looking for a chair in machine learning, full professor. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know. And then this is the final slide, which is, happens to be slide 42, also written in 42-point calibre light. Um, and so if you have any questions, then you know what the answer is going to be. Thank you very much. So thank you, Max. Are there questions? Yes. Can you go to the mic? So. There's somebody there, too. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm Erol from Berkeley. Could you please comment? Uh, you mentioned compression uh, using Bayesian uh, inference. Could you please compare how this compares with the state-of-the-art compression methods? Uh, you showed 240x compression, but that was for a very simple problem for MNIST, which we know that's not a very uh, representative problem in deep learning. Yeah, so of course we did a lot of experiments and a lot of you know, other data you know, uh, models as well. Um, and we compared to uh, a, a number of other methods, uh, including sort of more S SVD sort of uh, uh, sort of SVD type models where you sort of constrain the weight matrix and clustering methods and um, it typically looks like for large compression values it does a bit better um, than if you would use these other methods um, and for smaller compression levels it would do about the same but you know you should read our papers to see the full story about that because we have lots of experiments where we do all these things. Uh, uh, so, Max, you, you started by saying that physics is information, and then uh, you discussed how you reduce number of degrees of freedom in, in deep learning. But uh, another approach would be to put physics into, into those models. We often model physical world or engineered world, engineering world. So can you comment on that? A another way to reduce. Um, so that's uh, an interesting suggestion. Um, so one way I could see that could happen is if you, and you know, that's, that's something that we are definitely doing, which is you can model the device on which you are doing your computation. I'm not sure this is what you're heading for, but uh, so if you model you know, your phone or whatever you want to run your, you know, your, your deep learning model on, then uh, you can sort of directly optimize against you know, that simulation of that device or the real device. So in other, in other words, you, you use the physics to evaluate how well you're doing, and you give feedback to the learning algorithm to optimize against it. Is that where you're heading at, or more, maybe a more, princip more fundamental? Well, I, 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 I guess I'm asking how we mix uh, physics of so phenomena we want to model with deep learning with deep learning per se. So physics in form type of learning. Um, yeah, I would have to think about that more. That's a difficult question to do here on stage, but we should talk more. Uh. Yes. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, when you compress these neural networks, of course, you're making them simpler. Does it also mean that it makes it easier to explain what they're doing, either for a decision or to extract insights into what the network has learned that can teach us something? Um, I wish that were true, but I don't think it is really true. So uh, it's just removing you know, par bits and pieces off the model. So it's just 
you know, removing uh, sort of filters and it's removing weights. It's quantizing weights. So I don't think when I look at that, it looks any more interpretable to me than it was before, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Max, for the talk. Uh, one question I had is, while this method is, uh, this whole philosophy is striving for intelligence per kilowatt hour at the prediction time or consumption time, there's also the same question at the training time. Yeah. So right now in the current way of doing things, we are absolutely ignoring efficiency during training time, justifying for optimization of whatever we are seeing currently, and then focusing it on the downstream. Uh, how do you see this paradox or this paradox resolved? Well, it's a good question. Um, and in fact, you know, fortunately, you often have to do training once um, or, you know, not very frequently, uh, but execution, you could, you may have to do like a trillion times a day or something like that. So there is, there is a big difference between those two things. Yet, I think it is very interesting to think about if you can also uh, improve the efficiency of training. Uh, so typically, many methods, they use full precision representations of the model during training. And then, uh, but you could imagine that uh, you could develop methods that already use low precision, let's say, weights and activations during training time um, as well. Um, but I think that's a wide open area that, that looks very interesting to me. Next question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, Maxwell's demon. Uh, so I'm wondering if you're familiar with uh, uh, the arguments for reversible computing and how you view those arguments. Yeah, so interestingly, so the, at the very last, the very last part of the resolution of Maxwell's demon is that um, when you do reversible computation, so it turns out you can do these measurements of where, the, where all the molecules are during reversible computation, so that doesn't cost you any energy. It, but it seems that but you know, if you're at least thinking of a cycle, that you, at some point you'll have to delete uh, some of the information that you've written down um, and it's this deletion process which is not reversible, clearly. Um, and that's where you're going to spend your energy. So it turns out that any reversible computation can be done at zero energy cost. But typically, there is parts where things are non-reversible. And that part is where you're going to cost you, cost you energy. Next one. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So I find the spike neural net quite interesting. So have a, a general question is about, have you thought about using the spikes to code the gradient? Which means, in other words, uh, your gradient stay at zero most of the time, but when you want to move, you give it a, when you're very sure you, which direction to move, you give it a big spike. So the tempo average of the spikes basically encode the tempo average of the true gradient. I, I was wondering whether that's related somehow in, in concept. Yeah, I think um, I have to think a bit more about that. But um, we actually, in our back propagation pass, we also use a spiking architecture. So both the forward and the backward pass is using spiking. But then we do collect statistics before we actually do an update. Um, so yeah, so maybe you're suggesting something that even goes further, which is also encode the actual gradient in terms of spikes. But we haven't thought about that. Uh, we did think a little bit about if you have multiple sort of agents and they are sort of distributively learning, whether the messages between sort of the distributed learning agents can be represented using spikes. But it's a bit different than what you suggest, which is interesting. Okay, thank you. So we'll take the last two questions. And while doing that, um, can we have the next speakers start to set up? So uh, thanks for the talk, which is a I see it as a, all about how physics and computation uh, are intertwined at a deep level. Yeah. Um, and your background is in physics, and uh, you know, so we could think that it was that background enabled you to see these links as you as you uh, moved from one field to the other, or did both of them. But you could also see that that or see it as uh, your background in physics um, caused you to. Um, you know, I just really love the possibility of such connections. So I just wonder, you know, <laughs> as you look at your own self and introspect, uh, do you see both these forces and and uh, and uh, how do they they interplay? That's uh, a personal question. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I, surely I love the I you know the sort of the the fundamental nature of those questions. And uh, maybe I was speculating a bit in certain ways, um, but I actually like to think that 
you know, sticking out your neck and speculating a little bit is not a bad thing. But uh, yeah, I guess it, 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 it has influenced me a little bit in the way to think about this, yes. Thank you. Hi, Max, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wrangling my brain now to try and figure out if there's a connection between the adversarial problems that these networks face and entropy, and if there's a connection between um, this compression as a way of uh, helping to battle the adversarial example problem. Um, you mean like how beige, or how, if you quantize a network or compress it, whether it will help you against adversarial examples? Right, so somehow you're in some way reducing the dimensionality of the network a little bit, Yeah. Uh, even though you're getting rid of um, extraneous information in there. Uh, but maybe yeah, so this I think is a way to, yeah, exactly. I think I don't want to make any claims here because it seems like any time somebody comes up with an adversarial sort of and you know protections, you know it's easy. It's easy to beat it again. Um, there is some papers that say that at least following a Bayesian perspective will protect you a little bit, but not completely. Um, when you're doing massive compression of your neural net, I I don't think we can actually say with any certainty that it will become more robust against adversarial examples um, or less. So I don't think there's a clear connection, but maybe who knows. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Let's give him a round of applause again. <laughs>